Well, good morning, ladies. How are you? Oh, great answer. Very good. Very good. Okay. This is clicker. Great. Okay. Well, I'm really delighted to be here. I'm so excited uh, to talk about this topic and to share these issues with you. Uh, this is such a fantastic meeting. Farzana and all the leadership of AMWA has done a fantastic job. So thank you so much for inviting me. So what I'm going to talk about this morning is putting his and her science to work for women's health. So putting science to work for women's health and how we can think about that in 2015. On this occasion of your centennial, I kind of think of that as every woman's centennial because AMWA has been incredible in bringing attention to women's health from the very, very beginning. So I thought I'd begin by with uh, talking about some of the accomplishments that we've, we've achieved and highlighting the role of research in driving those accomplishments. Uh, it, it's kind of amazing to think that 20 years ago, um, a home pregnancy test was something that wasn't even heard of. The technology to me measure beta HCG in, in that kind of uh, precise way to be able to detect pregnancy and early pregnancy was not there. It were, was research efforts that developed those assays. So the chemistry, the biochemistry, the immunology behind developing an assay led to the home pregnancy test, something we take for granted now and certainly something that's, that's not available, unfortunately, to everyone. What about maternal, transmi maternal uh, transmission of HIV to, to, uh, to the newborn child or to the fetus? That is a huge deal. I think there are some very young people in this room, but many, many of us were or t have been taking care of patients when AIDS was first uh, coming to the fore, and we didn't know what this was. And so that was a very, very scary time. From an ophthalmology perspective, we got all of these patients that all of a sudden had CMV retinitis, and we were not seeing CMV, CMV retinitis, toxoplasma, uveitis, we weren't seeing that before. So it was a really challenging time. But we've now learned that antiretroviral therapy can really effectively prevent maternal to child transmission of HIV, which is a huge advance. And what about HPV vaccines? I mean, it was NCI, the National Cancer Institute, intramural investigators uh, were instrumental in developing the HPV vaccine, virtually uh, preventing uh, cervical cancer in areas where we can actually get the vaccine to the women who need it. Remains a huge issue, um, and 50% and of those affected in, in uh, countries around the world are still um, still have a risk for progression to cervical cancer. So we've got much, much more work to do in that area. And the Women's Health Initiative, which was a landmark study that continues to bear fruit, uh, resulted in us having 10 to 15,000 fewer cases of breast cancer every year. Women who did not get this disease, because we learned from this study where the National Institutes of Health applied incredible resources, un, uh, unheard of resources, to issues specific for women, specific to women's health, in a context, in a study design relevant for women. And that's what we're pushing for. We continue to reap the benefit. In fact, a new ancillary study was just started that's looking at uh, um, exercise as a preventive measure in the, in the Women's Health Initiative cohort. I think many of you may have heard fairly recently and of course uh, are aware of in your clinical practices about the fact that the FDA has announced that the recommended dosage of Zolpidem or Ambien is half as much as for men. That's the first sex-specific dosage labeling in this country. Uh, we now know that women clear Ambien, Zolpidem, much more slowly than do men. So the sleep aid given in the given before you go to bed or uh, for drugs like intermezzo in the middle of the night, the drug was not being as cleared as quickly in women as in men. So when the next morning, the, well, while women did not feel drowsy, the drug was still on board at a level that affected driving which is a safety issue, a public health issue for all of us. So we now know, of course, that aspirin is effective in, in preventing first heart attacks in men, but not in women. It's stroke in women. So there are different patterns in men and women, and research has helped us to learn all of that. This is the data point that got me interested as an ophthalmologist in doing what I do now. Um, I was asked were there sex differences in corneal and ocular immunology and, and immune diseases, and I answered yes. And uh, a gentleman who was doing a meta-analysis shared with me that two-thirds of those visually impaired or blind over the age of 40 worldwide, including in this country, are women. 
In some cases, it's because many of the eye diseases have age as a risk factor, and women certainly live longer than men, although that is that there are some changes there. Uh, but in, in this country, it's still the case, and we don't understand why. So that's particularly fascinating to me and helped me get into this area. What about smoking? Something very common. We still um, have an incredible role as physicians in our interactions with our patients to help them to understand the untoward effects of smoking in, in the number one change that could be done in anyone's life, uh, not to smoke or to quit smoking if you're smoking. There are sex differences in the effectiveness of various smoking cessation programs. Nicotine re replacement therapies work much better in men than they do in women. So if you know that, not to say that you wouldn't try that as part of your plan with your female patient, but you would be aware of that and you might move faster to the next therapy if, if that is not working. Chronic temporomandibular joint disorders, as are many other pain conditions, much more common in women than men. We know that because of research. Another very timely uh, point. Uh, we now know that our soldiers uh, are coming back with incredible risk uh, for PTSD and being deployed actually increases the, the rate of increase of suicide risk in women more than men. There still men uh, achieve suicide more than women, but the risk for women, the, the slope is higher for women than for men. Very, very interesting. We don't understand why, and incredible work remains to be done. In those addi addicted to cocaine, women respond more strongly to stress in terms of their risk for relapse than do men. Men will respond to the drug cues and the paraphernalia more than the stress cues. And this highlights the need for us to develop uh, targeted strategies to pair stress reduction with our addiction treatments. Osteoporosis, of course, is less common in men than women, but it's still a disease that can affect men, and we need to make sure that we don't only think of it as a woman's disease and that our men get diagnosed as well. As you know, there are racial and ethnic differences uh, uh, in osteoporosis risk. And something we're seeing more and more are uh, women, young girls, with ACL injuries, and female athletes are more likely than male athletes to, to injure their ACL. So we need to have more research to understand why that is. If we understood the biomechanics and the, the dynamics around that, there is some understanding about how, how women land when they jump as opposed to men. Perhaps we could design a orthotic in a shoe, for example, that would that would mitigate that risk. It wouldn't be a pink shoe. It would be a shoe designed based on data for women and girls. It wouldn't be a company selling us a pink shoe trying to tell us that's a female shoe, right? We want to work based on evidence and data. So that pink stuff, you got to check it out, make sure there's data. Pink's OK. I like pink, too. but. All righty, so I'm going to shift gears here and to tell you a little bit about what we're doing at the National Institutes of Health today. Uh, we're, our mission is to turn discovery into health, and that goes from basic science all the way to human health and disease. Translation is a key component of that, and clearly we need to fund and develop the biomedical workforce. To do that, we actually have to study both sexes, and that's part of what we do. Sex is a biological variable, and that's what I'm pushing for and others as well, to help make sure that female considerations and whether a, a treatment is safe and effective in both men and women is integrated into the design from the very beginning. I mentioned the WHI, and here I'm just going to give you a couple of data points. Uh, the, the trial cost $250 million, which was unheard of, and people criticized that and say that's too much money to put uh, towards a trial for, for women. But let's talk about the return, a $37 billion net economic return on this $250 million investment. You cannot get an ROI like that in anything else, certainly not in medicine. It spared 75,000 women from developing heart disease. Prevention, as we heard from Dr. Murthy yesterday, is key. We have got to shift our perspectives from only treatment to prevention and treatment. And it prevented, as I mentioned, many women from getting lung cancer and added 145,000 quality adjusted life years overall. So that is a very, very big deal. The Office of Research on Women's Health, which I'm privileged to be able to lead right now, we're celebrating our 25th anniversary. We're just a baby compared to Emwa. So 25 is a good age. You, you still feel you know, like you can conquer the world at 25. So we're excited about that. And, uh, and we were found on 
the, the notion that women were not being included in NIH-supported clinical research. And more than that, women weren't being included, and the findings from men were being applied to the treatment of women without understanding whether they were safe and effective in women. So that's a problem. I mean, that's why we were founded. And now, in 2015, uh, where we do have over 50% of the participants of NIH-funded clinical research are women. We're pushing now for sex and gender influences in health and disease, and these are our three mission areas, enhancing research on these areas, examining sex and gender influences, and promoting the recruitment, retention, and sustained advancement of women in biomedical careers. You know, women are more than 50% of the medical students, as we know, but when you look at the chair, the dean, the, all of those other leadership positions, we're not seeing that translated there. And clearly, that is not a pipeline issue. Women are in that pipeline. There are issues for women of color, and we're very interested in pushing those as well. So the first I'm going to talk about is this women in biomedical careers. I'm co-chairing this NIH working group with Dr. Collins, the director of NIH, and we're focusing on senior leadership support for women's career advancement. That's an area where women in the mid midpoint don't move forward, and we're really trying to work on that in terms of hiring, sponsorship, mentorship, promotions, and awards. And unkind, unconscious bias is another area that we're focusing on in terms of hiring practices, um, promotion practices, search committees and trying to raise awareness about the fact that there are very subtle ways and there's explicit and implicit bias going on that's preventing women from moving forward. From a variety of our research that we supported through this activity, we've learned that in institutional flexibility policies, while they exist, they're under-recognized, under-acknowledged, under-utilized, and in some cases, while the policy is on the books, the leadership doesn't support the policy, which makes women uh, reluctant to take advantage of the policies, and in some cases, men take advantage of these family-friendly policies more than do women, and when men take advantage of them, they are viewed as wonderful, and when women take advantage of them, they're viewed as taking advantage of the system. So we've got a lot of issues beyond having a policy. How do you implement a policy to achieve what it was intended to do? The Women of Color Research Network is a social media website that we've established to help bring awareness to some of the issues and disseminate information about women of color to everyone interested in diversity in the scientific workforce. So I encourage you to take a look at it, www.wocrn, Women of Color Research Network. .nih.gov. So we've got a wide variety of materials there. I certainly uh, encourage you to share this website and these resources with your uh, medical students, residents, and fellows. So I'll talk a little bit about some of the other things that we're doing in just a second. We've developed an uh, ORWH A to Z guide, and actually on our website, we highlight the sex differences in many conditions from A to Z. So if you're looking for a quick place to integrate something into your lectures or a quick uh, stinger to ask on rounds the next time you're rounding uh, about sex differences, we've got them right there for you. Whatever, whatever area you're in, we've got for you there. And it covers a variety of areas from influenza risk, you know, vaccine issues, uh, joint disease, many, many different areas. So we've got the material there for you. The one thing I want to make sure every single person gets from today's, um, my, my remarks today and takes back with you is the use of these terms. It's really important that we use the terms sex and gender correctly and distinctly and not use gender when we mean sex because we don't want to say sex. I have to say, when I first started this job, you know, when I said sex, it did, do, you know, it was, it was awkward to keep saying it. Now it says it means nothing. I mean, I can say it like any other word, so just get used to it. So when you say sex, we mean the biological differences between males and females, what is at a cellular level from our chromosomal makeup, certainly begins in utero, affects us at a genetic level. Every single cell has a sex, and that affects the functioning of that cell. It really does. There is incredible molecular biochemical differences between male and female cells. Female stem cells, for example, have more regenerative properties than male stem cells do. And I don't have time to go into all of that, but I know you all are partnering on the Sex and Gender Summit later in the year, so I hope that uh, you'll, you'll attend and learn more about that. Gender is related to your perception of yourself and your role in a cultural context. 
a societal context. It is on a continuum from a feminine to masculine when you're talking about behavior, incorporates gender identity, gender role, it's certainly not binary like male and female, a much more complex concept related. So a sex effect may be the fact that Ambien is metabolized more slowly in women than in men, and a gender effect would be the fact that women tend to have more help-seeking behavior and ask for, inter interact, for example, with a healthcare provider more frequently than a man does. From a gender perspective, that is not a sex difference. Uh, at this point, we don't understand that. Every single system, and I'm talking about the research system here and our medical education system, we design a system to get a result, okay? Um, I know many of you have seen this, um, this graphic. It shows a young woman and an old woman. The chin of the young woman is the nose of the older woman. Some people first see one, some people see the other, and a lot of people see both. The point there is that the systems are designed to get what the results that they are uh, intended to get. So when we are taught this is the dose for a 70 kilogram man, we're part of a system that's designed to get um, therapeutics for men. We understand things for men. But we have to change the way our system is designed and not work on a default. This default biology is a 70 kilogram man. In the lab, it's, just, it's male animals and male um, cells. That's the default. We don't want default biology. We want research by design. We want to design our systems to get what we want. And the notion of what's fundamental, in, at NIH, I get this pushback all the time, that what is fundamental? We're trying to understand fundamental differences, that it's not what is only seen in males and females, what's only shared, but what's different is fundamental, okay? So people will say, I'm not interested in the differences. I only want to know what's the same. So I'm going to quickly run through these last few slides just to bring you a little bit of attention about what is going on at NIH. Increased attention to enhancing reproducibility in the preclinical research space. And Dr. Collins and Dr. Tabak drew attention to the fact that failing to account for the effect of sex differences is part of what is uh, contributing to our difficulty with reproducibility. And then Dr. Collins and I wrote this piece on our plans to require investigators to address sex as a biological variable in their preclinical research. They can't tell us that we're only studying male animals because there's no data on females. That's unacceptable. There's no data on females, so that's why you need to study females. You can't tell us that you're using a male animal model, which is a real, this is a real situation, for Rett syndrome, which only affects girls, and you're using a male animal model. That is not a model of a human disease. That is not a model. That's not who's affected by the disease. So we gave additional money to that investigator to develop a female animal model for a disease that only affects women and girls. So uh, there's really increased attention to this at NIH and the scientific community about studying male and female biology, and it certainly takes all of us. It takes a village. There's incredible work to be done. We're encouraging studies to, uh, scientists to study both sexes, and we awarded $10.1 million in supplemental funds to existing grants for people to do that. Both males and females came in for that. Here are the disease areas that are covered, and you can see some are better represented than others. Cardiovascular and pulmonary and substance abuse are fields where the scientists are, are are more aware of these issues, but infectious diseases down to 1%, that's a problem. We know there are major differences in males and females in response to infection, so we've got lots of work to do there. The Science of Sex and Gender and Human uh, Health is an online course that we developed. I encourage you to, to uh, spread the word about that to your students and residents and fellows. There are three modules that go through all of these issues in great detail. You can get CME, CNE, CBs. Every CE you can get, we've got, we've added that to the course, so your nurses and your colleagues, and look at some of the topics, sexual dimorphism and metabolic bone disorders, and the neural basis of sex differences and pain. It's not just that women are complaining of pain, they're not just more likely to report pain, which could be a gender issue, they actually feel pain differently than men. And we understand that there are neurologic, neural reasons for that. So could we develop treatment strategies that are uh, designed to take advantage of that? 
We developed a page on our website calling Studying Sex to Strengthen Science, or S4 for short, and here are the resources that are on that page. We have a variety of um, landmark articles. We have links to videos of our workshops and discussions from different um, investigators who were doing this. This is my, I think, second to last slide, and this is a catchphrase. I also want to take you to take away. So sex and gender, if you hear anybody using that incorrectly, you need to ask them, do you mean sex or do you mean gender? That's not a threatening question. We just want to clarify, what are you talking about? Or and sometimes we don't know. And so we'll often use sex slash gender, which is perfectly acceptable. If we don't know, we just put it out there. So these are the four C's of studying sex to strengthen science to help us remember this all. The first C is consider. We want people to consider that sex might be influencing your research or whatever you're doing. If you're reviewing a paper, at the very beginning, consider sex might play a role here. At the beginning, you're thinking about it. Design a study to look, look and keep that in mind or just explain why not. There may be a valid reason why not. Collect your information by sex, tabulate it that way, and report data disaggregated by sex. There are still papers that are being put out there, and you guys are reviewers. You're in a position to say, you know, you need to disaggregate this data. Uh, table one shows us how many women or females you had. Where's the data disaggregated by sex? Characterize and analyze your data by sex as appropriate. Many studies are not powered to look for sex differences. That's fine, but some studies are, and you need to characterize that. And then when you publish or communicate results or, or a review or give a lecture, Include this in your, in your lecture, in your remarks. Uh, talk about the fact that there may be male and female differences and similarities. And so in 2015, this is what NIH is doing. Uh, we're going beyond inclusion. Sex and gender influences in health and disease is the way that we're thinking about the maximum way to inform and improve women's health is by putting every single part of a scientific <laughs> enterprise to work for women's health. This is not a separate issue. This is an issue that every single person who's in a scientific or biomedical research enterprise should be considering. So I tell everybody at NIH they should all be doing women's health research. Every single 27 institutes and centers. That'll go from cell and animal studies, preclinical research, toxicology, from phase one all the way through phase four clinical trials, in our analyses and reporting, in our education, in our developing our policy, and most importantly, why we are all physicians in delivering health care to our patients. Thanks so much for your attention.